Ah. So, I've called this talk The Primacy of Consciousness. And I want to go further than a number of speakers have gone here at this conference, not only to show that consciousness is absolutely fundamental, but there is only consciousness, despite what you see. So I want to start with what the Science Journal, a few years ago on the 125th anniversary, said there are they looked at the 25 unanswered questions of modern science. And number one was, what is the universe made of? And the answer is, today, we have absolutely no idea. <laughs> science is actually in a crisis. We have lots of experiments, lots of data, lots of funny things happening, and no one knows what's going on. And we have lots of theories. We have, you know, what are... What's the universe made of? Is it made of quarks and gluons and things? Or is it, you know, other elementary particles? Is it strings? Is it quantum loops? Is it M theory? Is there dark matter out there or not? Is there dark energy? We have all these different theories, and they all explain bits of it, but none of them explain all of it. And this is the first time in history we've been in this situation where we have all these unknowns and no, and no real competing theory. The second unanswered question is, what is the biological basis of consciousness? And again, we have lots of theories about how does consciousness arise from the brain, does it arise from the brain, all these different ideas, and we're still at a complete loss. And I think part of the reason is we are looking at it from totally the wrong perspective. I just want to briefly cover the two major evolutions of modern physics in the last century. The first was the theory of relativity, which showed, first of all, something we all know, math and energy, mass and energy are equivalent, that famous equation. Here it's ohm equals mc squared, but Einstein said e equals mc squared. Energy and matter are equivalent and, in a way, interchangeable, and space and time are relative and also interchangeable. And I just put the equation up there because people don't, just to see the similarity between energy and matter, the equation, and the equation between space and time. And C represents the speed of light. And we're discovering something fascinating that the speed of light, or light itself, seems to be absolute and actually more fundamental than matter, energy, space, or time. The second great revolution was, of course, quantum theory, and we've been looking at a lot here. And some of the challenges there were, first of all, wave-particle complementarity, which a number of speakers have looked at, the double-slit experiment. Then there's the collapse of the wave function. Speakers have spoken about when you, something is just in a probable state until you actually observe it, and then one of the infinite number of probabilities, or thousands of probabilities, suddenly comes into existence when you observe it. And there's the uncertainty principle that says even when you do observe it, you can't know everything about it. If you measure a particle's momentum, measure its speed, you don't actually know where it is. If you measure where it is, you don't know how fast it's going. If you measure its energy, you can't actually tell when you measured its energy. If you measure when it is, you don't know what its energy is within certain limits. All weird. And then there's entanglement, which we, if you don't know what entanglement is by now, <laughs> you must have just arrived. And what's fascinating about these is they're showing two things, these two revolutions. First, that science, ma sorry, space, time, matter, energy aren't absolute. There's no fixed material world, physical world, which was one of the great shocks. And the second thing is that consciousness, observation, knowing play a crucial role in it somehow. But what we're trying to do is these two great revolutions pointed to something profound. There's no, doesn't seem there's a material, physical world like we thought there is, and consciousness is somehow deeply involved. And yet nearly all the ways we're trying to understand these phenomena is we're trying to understand them within a mindset that thinks there is a material, that there is a material world, and from a paradigm that says consciousness isn't really important. And to me, this is no wonder we're not getting anywhere. 
they're pointing to a completely new way of looking at the world, and we're still stuck in a sort of pre-20th century way of thinking, and we can't quite bear to imagine what the world might be like if we really took these implications seriously. Which is why Richard Feynman said, nobody understands quantum physics. And I think he's right. I don't think anybody will understand quantum physics and still we, until we start including consciousness within the equation. So, I want to look at a couple of things. First of all, what do we mean by reality? Because we use reality in two senses. Either there's the physical reality, the world out there, the world you're seeing now, or so it seems, and then there's the experience reality that appears in consciousness. And that's what you're actually experiencing, is not the room out there, you're experiencing what appears in consciousness. And so we use reality in both these ways. And what's happening, and this is, we all know this, in fact this is one of the things that science or psychology, neurophysiology, fully understands, but it doesn't actually think, of, think it through the implications. What we know is that the world out there, whatever it is, and we'll look at that in a moment, gets processed by the brain, and we have this experience of seeing, hearing, tasting, touching the world out there. But we're actually living in a virtual reality created by the brain. It's a very good one, it's a pretty accurate one, it allows us to navigate around. This is where I think, you know, when I reach out to touch this, is it is where I see it. But we're actually living in a reality created by the brain. And so as well as being an information processor, we can say the brain is actually a reality generator, continually generating experience for us. And so what we actually see are representations of the world out there. We don't actually see the world out there. We are seeing representations of it that the brain's created. So all that we ever know of the world is actually an inference from experience. And, and this is really important because we, th we think we're seeing the world out there. We make all these um, statements about it. And what science is trying to do, the goal of science is to understand what the world out there is like, how it functions. And we're doing all of this from taking data from our actual experience and projecting it out onto the world out there. And it's all to do with, again, with knowing. And it's interesting, the word science comes from the Latin scire, to know, and the word consciousness comes from the Latin scire. It means to know with, conscire, consciousness. So the science looks at what is known, and consciousness is what we know with. It's that we know with our consciousness. Our knowing takes place in consciousness. Now, the problem with all this is we imagine that the world out there is just like our experience of it. So, you know, right now there's, you know, there's green leaves over there. There's actually no green over there. There's something over there which sends off light of a certain energy, a certain wavelength, which is just another concept in the mind. And that light hits my eye, the retina, sends impulses down to the brain, but they're not green impulses, there's nothing green about it. The brain processes it and comes up, for me, with the experience of green. But the greenness is only in my experience, it's not out there. And that's the same with Everything, if I'm smelling a flower, the flower itself doesn't smell. It sends out molecules which touch my nose and the brain creates this reality of the aroma of, of a flower. But it's only in the mind. Or you're hearing my voice. But what's actually happening is air molecules, whatever they are, are moving backwards and forwards and hitting your eardrum and hitting little hairs there which process it and create the experience of you hearing my voice. But it's all only in the mind. 